Introducing a priori. Welcome to today's presentation from a priori's Manufacturing Insights Conference 2022. Plastic molding, sourcing saving strategies, and manufacturing model enhancements. For those who don't know me, my name is Andy Clark. I'm a product manager here at Apriori. I'm responsible for the development of our sheet metal, plastic molding, and composites manufacturing models. I'm a qualified mechanical engineer with an industrial background in oil field services. I started my career in field operations, installing oil and gas equipment on offshore oil rigs for two years. Subsequent to that, I spent five years working in the Engineering and Manufacturing Technology Center, where I worked in product design, design for manufacture, and production manufacturing. I had the significant privilege of working in a facility that had in-house manufacturing assembly and testing facilities, spending significant amounts of time on the shop floor, often getting very polite feedback from the machinists and technicians on how we in engineering could better engineer our products. I then transitioned to the software industry, working for three years as an expert services consultant here at a priori, prior to moving to product management in January of this year. So quickly summarize today's presentation topics. I'll go through our cost per cycle time sourcing opportunity identification strategy. Then I'll spend some time on two of our significant improvements to the plastic molding model. So cooling time calculations and our comp force and machine selection enhancements before summarizing at the end and closing. Plastic injection molded parts can be used in a multitude of applications and across a vast range of industries. This is reflected in the fact that plastic molding manufacturing model is one of our most highly licensed models. It's also a market that continues to grow um, and the market is expect the global market is expected to be worth over 266 billion dollars uh, by 20, 20, 2030. As I mentioned previously, I'll be first introducing a tried and tested sourcing strategy for identifying cost saving opportunities within your plastic molding commodity spend. But I want to quickly re-familiarize everyone with a few important details of the plastic molding process, which are relevant to today's content. So the process itself looks a bit like this. Firstly, a mold is mounted onto an injection molding machine. Resin, uh, molten resin is then injected into the mold at high pressure, filling the mold cavity. The part then remains in the mold until it cools enough to be removed. The mold then opens and ejects the part. Once the part has been ejected, the mold closes and the cycle begins again. If we look at a typical breakdown for each of these stages in the cycle, we can see how cooling time dominates the total cycle time, sometimes even more significantly than we see represented in this chart. Now that we've recapped the process, it's important to understand what size of machine we want to make our part on. There's several factors that will decide what machine your part is made on, such as mold size, shot size, and clamping force. Clamping force is typically one of the most important factors in selecting a machine for production. Your machine must be able to provide enough force to keep the mold closed while high pressure melt is being injected. As with most things, the more capable the equipment, the more expensive it is. So it's important to ensure your parts are being made on an appropriately sized machine. If we look at this representation of the cost breakdown of a typical plastic molded part, we can see that aside from raw material, the highest contributing factor to cost is direct overhead, which is largely derived from machine cost. Now that I've covered those prerequisites, I'd like to talk about the cost per cycle time savings identification strategy. Let me ask you a question. If you send an RFQ to a supplier and they decide to bid on the job, what is the absolute minimum information that you expect to get? Quota cost. In an ideal world, all suppliers would provide us with full and comprehensive cost breakdowns. However, sometimes, probably more often than not, suppliers don't provide the, that cost breakdown by default. And if you request one, it may take some time to be provided. In this strategy, we leverage the a priori cost. The, the, in this strategy, we leverage the quoted cost from the supplier in conjunction with the cycle time and machine selection data generated by a priori. We understand that piece part cost is the sum of the material cost, manufacturing cost, and any SGA and A and margin. We also expect that parts made on similar sized machines should be charged at a similar rate. 
From here, we can calculate the cost per cycle time of a given part. We take the material cost per mass and calculate the material cost and subtract this from the quoted cost given to us by the supplier. We also subtract any SGNA and margin associated with the material to leave us the manufacturing cost. If we now divide this resultant cost by the cycle time, we now have the cost per cycle time. You may be thinking, well, what use is this to me? And I would perhaps think the same thing if I were talking about a single part. However, if we look across multiple parts made on the same machine or similar capacity machine or capability machine, we can identify the cost per cycle time trend and identify outliers. Let me demonstrate. Each of these stacks represents the piece part cost breakdown of a quoted injection molded part. On the primary x-axis is the cost, and the secondary x-axis is cycle time. If we use a priori's machine selection, as we can see at the bottom of the screen here, we've only got parts that are made on a machine of a given clump force. So these parts should all be able to manufacture on the same machine. If we backed out the material cost and any associated SGNA and margin, we're left with the manufacturing cost. If we then divide this manufacturing cost by the cycle time, we get our cost per cycle time across this range of parts. And from here, we can identify our trend and also outliers. Once outliers are identified, we can approach our supplier and validate the in-trend parts as having the correct parameters. Once this validation is done, we then introduce our outlier parts and request an explanation for the price difference against our benchmark part. You may expect to get explanations about a part being thicker or larger or having a higher volume or a longer cycle time. However, each of these scenarios is taken into consideration by the removal of material cost and division by the cycle time. If the supplier is unable to justify the difference in cost per cycle time parity, then a reduction in price should be negotiated. From this strategy, we can understand the importance of cycle time and also of machine selection. This is a strategy that was pioneered by our applied services team. It has been ex executed by them many times and yielded very significant savings for multiple customers. Here's an example from this year where a new customer was able to realize $170,000 of annual savings on just four plastic molded parts. At this point, I'd like to add that this strategy isn't exclusive to plastic molding, but can also be applied to other processes. However, the more processes and machines that are introduced, the more complicated and noisy the calculation tends to get. For any machining customers in the audience, applying this for parts made on a single milling machine, for example, would be another good use case. Now that I've covered this strategy, I want to talk about the recent enhancements and developments that have taken place on the injection molded manufacturing model. Given the significant success we've seen to date with this strategy, you may well ask yourself why we need to invest further in development of the plastic molding model. Well, at a priori, we constantly strive to improve our models to offer customers better, more accurate, more reliable models, thus giving you more confidence in the data generated. While we have seen high levels of sex, while we have seen high levels of success in typically smaller, more uniform wall thickness parts, we're receiving feedback from customers that a priori was generating unexpected results for parts with irregular wall thickness distribution, and also large parts that in reality have multiple gates relating to cooling time and clamping force respectively. We saw this as an opportunity to broaden the coverage of the part types that we're seeing from our customers and the support for those, for those part types. From the initial slides, we understand that cooling time is typically dominant in the cycle time of an injection molded part. Well, let's take a look at how we calculate cooling time. A priori uses the industrially and academically accepted Bowman and Schuschmidt cooling equation, first published in modern plastics back in 1959. It uses the production parameters of melt temperature, mold temperature, and inject temperature, as well as the thickness at dimensions and material thermal properties to calculate a cooling time. If you look at the top line of the equation, we can see that the wall thickness variable is squared. This means that any increase in wall thickness leads to an exponential increase in the cooling time. 
This is the reason that typically the first rule of plastic molding design is to keep a uniform wall thickness. It's also worth noting that the thermal diffusivity of the material is a very sensitive variable. So if the specific resin you're using has data available, it's beneficial to enter that into a priori. So the calculation gives the temperature time curve like this. And the part cooling time is how long after injection the part reaches ejection deflection temperature. This all seems very straightforward for parts with constant wall thickness like this. As previously mentioned, we're seeing um, unexpected results for parts with significant wall thickness variations. <clears throat> Compensate for this, a priori passes in a variable known as nominal wall thickness, the thickness in the equation. Nominal wall thickness is a representation of the part's general thickness. In versions previous to 21.1, a priori used a weighted average using average wall thickness and maximum wall thickness. It was found to be overly conservative for parts with isolated very thick sections. To address this issue, we saw the need to classify parts. To enable the classification, we extracted additional wall thickness data in the form of the thickness standard deviation across the part, and also the max thickness of the 80% majority of the part. We then classified parts into four camps. One, parts with a high aspect ratio. Two, parts with low thickness deviation. Three, parts with medium thickness deviation. And four, parts with high thickness deviation. And different nominal wall thickness equations are then applied depending on the categorization. Here we can see a visualization of the different wall thickness attributes for a set of parts and the categorization of each part at the top. The upper green line of the chart represents the maximum wall thickness. At the bottom in yellow, we have our minimum wall thickness. And above there, we have the average wall thickness in gray. In blue and orange, we have our previous and new nominal wall thicknesses, respectively. We can clearly see how the previous nominal wall thickness was more biased towards the part's maximum thickness. The result of this work is significantly improved nominal wall thickness calculations, and that's cycle time for parts with irregular wall thickness distribution. We can see here our previous cycle time is in orange, our reported cycle time from customers is in blue, and our new a priori calculated cycle time in grey. This data was validated with the support of six different customers from different indus industries, including several of who were able to provide us shop for production cycle time data. To clarify, this enhancement has been available since June 2021 in our 21.1 major release. Now let's have a look at the second area development, clamp force and machine selection. This next enhancement is particularly relevant for parts that feature multiple gates, such as large parts or parts made from resins that are difficult to flow. A priori's existing clamp force calculation is conservative, assuming a single gate placed on the short side of the part, giving the longest possible flow length. Our clamp force calculation uses a material's minimum and maximum pressures from the material library, and will select a point in this range based on a number of parameters, the most significant being flow ratio. This flow ratio calculation is the part length divided by the nominal wall thickness. Depending on the results of this calculation, we may select a lesser value in the range or a higher value in the range. For smaller parts like this, the resultant data aligns with reported pr production parameters. For large and long, for large and long narrow parts, this would typically result in an overestimation of the required pressure and thus higher clamp force. In reality, multiple gates would be utilized to achieve mold fill at a reasonable pressure. We addressed this issue iteratively. First, in our 22.1.1 service pack, we introduced a manual process setup option driven solution to better calculate the flow length for the flow ratio calculation I just mentioned. The user can select the PSO for hot or cold runner, how many gates there are and how they're distributed. For example, we could select a long side cold runner with two gates and we get this flow length. Or alternatively, hot runner layout with four gates. The results were then validated with an automotive customer prior to being included in our baseline. 
After developing the geometric calculation based on flow length enhancements and looking to iterate the development further to align in our automation strategy, it was said, wouldn't it be cool if we could do something similar to the physics-based injection molding flow analysis packages available? And now I'm in a very privileged position in that I work with a team with some of the most talented and creative engineers and developers I've ever met. And we put um, ourselves the challenge of trying to achieve this. Now I'm excited to break cover on the new functionality that provides an integrated light flow analysis to calculate the minimum number of gates required for a particular part and tool type. We're calling this flow and flow appraisal. We'll be supporting gating for both hot and cold runner tooling. We're looking to include in the next major release pending full validation against one of those aforementioned physics based flow analysis packages. The next few slides gives a demonstration of how this functionality looks in our current development environment. In this instance, we have a car bumper made from ABS. This flow analysis is for a hot runner tool. The calculated number of gates for the part flow properties is six and the resultant flow ratio is 144. This number is utilized by the cost model as mentioned in the previous slide to calculate the required clamp force and thus machine selection. The analysis will also assess the flow characteristics for a cold runner tool with the gates along the long edge. What we can see here, indicated by the black color, is that regardless of how many gates we put along the long side, the material would not be able to flow to the extremities of the mold, thus resulting in a short shot. This condition will be accessible to the user in terms of design for manufacturer insight. Lastly, we can see that a cold runner tool with the gates on the short side Again, regardless of how many gates we put in the short side, the melt will never fill the extremities of the mold. In this next example, we'll take a look at the same part, but in polypropylene, in polypropylene a material that flows considerably better than ABS. We can see that now we're able to fill the mold with two gates compared to the six gates required for ABS with a hot runner tool. If we then look at cold runner with edge gates, in this example, we can see um, with gates positioned on the long side, the mold is able to be filled with four gates. And in this very last example, we can see how even with a better flowing resin, positioning the gates on the short side of the part will still result in a short shot. The manufacturing model will evaluate the PSO settings with respect to whether the user has selected a hot or cold runner and return values of the appropriate flow appraisal conditions. This adds significant functionality to the a priori clamp force calculation and allows us to have increased confidence on the machine selection and thus direct overhead cost for larger uh, parts typically needing multiple gates as well as giving uh, design for manufacture feedback uh, on short shot conditions Our continued commitment to model improvement and expansion offers the opportunity to get better, more accurate, more reliable data to power cost saving identification opportunities. Nominal wall thickness improvements were implemented in 21.1. Nominal wall thickness improvements are planned, uh, sorry, clamp force improvements will be available in our 23.1 release pending a full validation. Please contact your customer success team to learn more about this sourcing strategy or work directly with your applied services team to start identifying and realizing savings now. Thank you very much for your attendance today. A priori, making profitability and sustainability a reality for a better world.